this is Tom Fox. I would like to welcome you to a five-part conversation with K2 Intelligence Finn on navigating an increasingly complex sanctions landscape. This podcast series is sponsored by K2 Intelligence Finn. In this conversation, I'm joined by Adam Frey. Adam is a managing director at K2 Intelligence Finn, working across both financial crimes, risk, and compliance, investigations, and disputes practices. As a key member of the firm's independent consultant team, at the direction of federal, state, and international regulators, he works to monitor and assess global financial institutions' compliance with AML and OFAC enforcement actions and related consent orders. Frey helps K2 Finn's intelligence reviews of institutions, BSA, and AML sanctions programs. He helps clients mitigate risk associated with litigation, alleged misconduct, to ensure their anti-corruption and international financial sanctions policies and procedures. Also, Eric Lorber, who is the vice president at K2 Intelligence Finn, where he advises global financial institutions on issues related to sanctions and AML and combating financing for the terrorist compliance. Prior to joining K2 Intelligence, Fannie was Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence at the U.S. Department of Treasury, where he provided strategic guidance on U.S. sanctions, AML, and CFT policies. He's previously worked at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, where he advised clients on the areas of international trade and compliance. In this series, we will take a look at the current landscape. In episode two, building sanctions into your compliance program. Three, so you think you violated a sanctions breach, what happens next? Four, a new exposure for corporates and shipping space. And conclude with what's down the road. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, backing in with Eric Lorber for episode three of our five-part series. Today, we're going to take a look at the always dicey question of, you think you violated a sanctions breach, what happens next? Eric, first of all, uh, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Great to be back with you today. Eric, I think this is probably one of the questions that gives compliance officers and indeed uh, uh, company executives and even boards of directors the most heartburn uh, is around what happens if you think you violated um, a sanction or even get had a si- sanctioned breach. So what happens if you think there's been some sort of uh, potential sanctions breach? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and and I think you're absolutely right. It's definitely one of those situations uh, that can create real heartburn. Um, a couple of sort of core lessons or key lessons to think about when, when this potentially happens. The first key lesson um, is you, you cannot ignore it. Um, you, you know, you have to figure out whether or not there, there has been a breach or whether or not you assess there has been a breach and then take, uh, appropriate steps accordingly. So, you know, we've seen situations, um, where, you know, individuals have, have violated sanctions and try to potentially cover it up, you know, or, or, um, have not paid sufficient attention to it. And that will, almost always lead to additional um, interest and potential enforcement activity um, by OFAC or by the relevant regulator um, or enforcement uh, enforcement agency. So the core lesson number one um, is, you know, don't hide it, figure out exactly what it is um, and, and, you know, be prepared to escalate it up your internal chain um, and also potentially to notify the regulators Though we'll get to that um, in a second. The second sort of core lesson on this one, uh, which I think is really important, is, um, you know, talk to internal counsel and potentially outside counsel. One of the things which I think um, is is so tricky uh, about the sanctions space is just how confusing um, some of the, uh, the sanctions laws and regulations are and what is and is not uh, permissible. And so, Oftentimes, um, you know, when you look, for example, at an OFAC sanctions regulation, and then you look at a general license, right? So a license that permits a, um, a, a class of activity related to, to that prohibition, um, it can be very difficult to decipher um, exactly what is and is not permissible. And frankly, the regulations themselves are often written in a fairly broad, uh, fairly broad um, way, so that OFAC has tremendous discretion. So again, it can not necessarily be clear. Highly urge um, if you think that there could have been a violation or can be a violation 
to talk to a sanctions compliance attorney, either in-house um, or, or outside, who can give you uh, something of a better sense for whether or not the activity that you think has happened um, would potentially constitute a sanctions violation or a sanctions breach. Um, and then, you know, sort of third, a third key lesson on this one um, really is to figure out exactly what happened. So, you know, obviously you don't want to hide what happened. You want to get an outside opinion or an internal counsel opinion as to what happened. But, you know, really what's important here is for uh, you to conduct an internal investigation to focus um, on on what's ha- what's occurred, and I think the the purpose of this investigation um, should be uh, should be multifold. First purpose is, as I mentioned, just getting a sense of exactly what has happened and exactly what has not happened. Right, so you know, getting the facts straight because these facts are going to be incredibly important in determining internally, whether or not you think a violation has occurred, but also from OFAC or other sanctions uh, enforcement agency, them determining or their determination as to whether or not a violation has occurred. So that's that's sort of the first core reason for an internal investigation. The second core reason um, is actually to get a sense of, you know, whether or not um, the violation occurred as sort of a one-off. So just, you know, something bad happened, you know, it it was, you know, not the result of a problematic compliance process, but it it happened to be missed, which of course does happen, as opposed to um, an issue where they're suggestive of a a broader compliance breakdown. And you're going to want to know that. And you're going to want to know that for two reasons. One is you're going to want to know that um, because that will be something that the regulatory authorities or enforcement authorities will look at and they'll take into account when thinking about what action to take. And second, you're also going to want to know that because you should be thinking even at this stage of, okay, well, so if there does appear to be a violation, what steps can I proactively take to make sure that it doesn't happen again? I mean, there's sort of really nothing worse than you know, seeing some type of um, a violation that's occurred and then not taking the, you know, the necessary steps to actually fix that, the, 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 the situation that led to that violation. No, so those are the sort of big three things um, I think you're going to want to do. You're going to want to sort of make sure that you, you know, understand exactly what's happened through an investigation. You're going to want to get some type of, of outside or internal counsel to weigh in as to whether or not you think it, you know, it is permissible or if it was indeed a violation. And then, you know, at its core, you're really you're going to have to deal with this issue. This is not a situation where you can um, uh, pull a, uh, you know, an ostrich uh, sticking its head in the sand when you see a red flag or you see something that's happened, hoping that it will just kind of, you know, uh, go away. Um, it, it definitely needs to be uh, proactively addressed uh, head on. Eric, um, some of the most, I don't want to say difficult conversations, but maybe that is the right word I've had at the corporate senior executive and board level are around whether or not to self-report. And I was wondering if you could help us walk through how you would help a client think through the steps for self-reporting a breach or even a potential breach. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is it's a great, great question, Tom. And it's something that we do um, as a matter of course, because it is one of the trickiest areas. There are multiple competing considerations for thinking about self-reporting. So um, before we get into sort of, you know, uh, uh, those considerations, I think a bit of background here um, is would be useful to the audience um, when describing, you know, just what the consequences of um, of reporting um, uh, or not reporting a violation that ends up, you know, coming to the attention of OFAC. And the core lesson on this one is that OFAC in particular has a great deal of flexibility in what it decides to do when it thinks that there's been a violation, right? There are at least sort of four big actions that it could take, right? So one is there's a no action letter where it essentially looks at some activity and says, well, you know, we don't actually think this is a violation. Like you may have thought it was a violation, but we are actually, we're, we take a different position. So you're okay. There can be a finding of violation, which is just as it says, a finding that there has been a violation. But for some reason, OFAC decides that they don't want to impose a monetary penalty, right? This could be because the, you know, the, the violation itself is so small and it was just a one-off thing that doesn't really matter. Um, there could be a civil monetary penalty. So here is, you know, where you sort of see the 
the fines that OFAC will impose um, for you know breakdowns in compliance programs or or in, you know in some cases intentional or reckless behavior, and then sort of the the highest end of the of the spectrum you have criminal referral right if there's been criminal activity. Um, uh, OFAC will often refer that in the United States anyway to the Department of Justice. So OFAC has all of these options. But one one thing that's really important to keep in mind here, and as I mentioned, you know, when I first started chatting about flexibility, um, the vast majority of breaches uh, do not result in public um, in public enforcement activity. So it's something like you know above ninety five percent of of alleged violations or alleged breaches don't actually result in either a finding of violation, a civil monetary penalty, or a criminal referral. OFAC has a lot of discretion for figuring out just what it wants to do. And OFAC tends to focus the public, um, the public enforcement actions and the public activity on sort of two categories um, of, of violations. One category is where there's been really, you know, uh, clear, intentional, or you know, grossly negligent or reckless wrongdoing, right? So, like, either there was clearly a bad actor who was trying to violate sanctions or hide or evade them, or the compliance program that was in place was so kind of you know underdeveloped that it really you know it, it didn't pass kind of the smell test. And the second one is that if OFAC wants to send a message to the industry, if they want to say, you know, this company. Is, is abiding by, you know, industry practices when it's doing this particular type of screening, for example. So, you know, not using fuzzy logic screening, using, you know, um, yeah, name matching screening. That's not acceptable to us at OFAC. So we're going to impose a fine on this company. It's going to be, you know, a decent sized fine, nothing astronomical. But everybody else needs to pay attention to that in this industry, because you should know that if we're fine this company for, you know, using exact name uh, matching, you should not be using that same type of name matching in your screening systems. So that's kind of the first step is sort of what are OFAC's options here? Um, and the reason that's important is because that can sort of color uh, how you think about um, dealing with a potential or, or potential violation that you think may have occurred. So there's one other really important point to note on this one, which is OFAC has a process um, for self-disclosure. It's called a VSD, a voluntary self-disclosure. And it actually creates an incentive structure for companies to self-report, right? The big incentive is um, if you, if you self-report, you get 50% off the base penalty, Right. So, you know, let's say that's a penalty that should be in the amount of, you know, one hundred thousand dollars. It's cut 50 percent automatically if you're self-reporting, um, self-reporting a violation. And in addition to that, if you're self-reporting, remember, OFAC has all that flexibility for what it decides to do, if it's going to take public enforcement action or not. Oftentimes, OFAC will take into account the fact that you filed a VSD in making a determination as to whether or not to engage in public enforcement activity at all. So there are real benefits um, to, to filing VSDs, and OFAC has set it up in that way to encourage people you know, to report issues that they're having. They're not trying to play a game of gotcha. They actually want people to come in and tell them, here are some of the, the things that we're seeing and here are some of the issues that we're having. Um, a, couple, a couple caveats on that. One is you actually have to be the first person to file um, a VSD for the particular alleged violation. So like, let's say you're a financial institution and you know it's a, a transaction where another financial institution actually detects the violation and files first. Well, you can't then file afterwards and get the credit. It's the first person to file gets the credit, which is important. And the other point is that um, you must be open and forthcoming with your uh, with your VSD. So you can't kind of include half of the information and hope that OFAC doesn't get the other half of the information. You have to sort of provide a complete um, assessment of, of what happened. And that's important because, you know, I've just kind of talked about what the, uh, you know, the benefits of filing VSDs are. And it sounds like, great, why wouldn't you recommend filing a VSD um, in every situation? There are good reasons in certain situations where we counsel clients that it may not be appropriate to file a VSD. And the primary reason relates to the fact that if you do file disclosure, you know, you're likely to get additional questions from OFAC. And so there are situations where, you know, 
if you file a VSD and you get additional questions, all of a sudden your entire compliance program um, is open to you know review potential subpoena by a U.S. enforcement agency, and that can be a very uncomfortable situation to be in. So, and sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes you really should file a VSD, but other times, let's say it's a situation where you see um, uh, some type of you know um, activity occurring uh, in your company, and you're looking at it, and you know it could be a violation. But it's really a gray area of law. This goes back to the point I was making before about you know counsel having having counsel weigh in. It's not clear that it's a violation. It's really on the fence, right? In situations like that, sometimes what we counsel clients to do is to say get and you know get a counsel's opinion and write a memo to file, and as you know make the argument or or make you know suggest a conclusion that you know in that memo to file. What you think happened is not a violation and keep it on hand because oftentimes what can occur is if OFAC does find out about it and they do come, uh, they do come knocking and say, hey, we think there may have been something that happened here. You know, wh- why didn't you disclose it or, you know, give us some more background? You have something that you can trot out to them to say, hey, we saw that, too. We're definitely on the same page with you in terms of catching it, but we don't actually think it's a violation. And here's why. And a document like that, a memo to file like that can really help protect you and can sort of put you into that category of, well, you know, OFAC sees this as an issue, but it's not going to be something which is going to result in public enforcement action. You may just get, you know, OFAC saying, okay, well, don't do this again. You know, this is something you need to close up with your compliance program. So, Eric, what – I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? No, 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 please, please, go ahead. Yeah, um, really the compliance officer takes, I think, the next – question pretty seriously and definitely in the wheelhouse of mitigation or remediation. Um, how do you help a uh, client think through the steps uh, to mitigate the negative consequences of an apparent violation? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good one. Um, and again, we're still kind of in this uncomfortable world, right, of, oh, I think there's been a violation. What are the best things I can do? Um, as I mentioned, you know, as we just discussed, obviously a, a voluntary self-disclosure um, is or can be an important uh, step for mitigation, though that, that can oftentimes be sort of down the line. Um, like I mentioned, an internal investigation uh, is oftentimes critical in just ensuring that you know um, exactly what happened and if something went wrong, exactly what went wrong. Um, And then there are a couple of other steps which we haven't really talked about yet, but which I think are are pretty important. Um, One is, you know, cooperating with um, with OFAC and and with the relevant enforcement um, authorities. I mean, you'll see in OFAC enforcement action press releases um, that they'll often, you know, they'll they'll take different factors into consideration when thinking about, you know, the size of the civil monetary penalty and whether or not they decide to engage in enforcement activity. And one of those factors, a mitigating factor, is almost always cooperation um, with uh, with the enforcement agencies. So it can be something from tolling the statute of limitations to providing sort of open information or, a, 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 you know, all the information requested um, by those agencies. So establishing to the extent you can a cooperative relationship within bounds um, is, uh, is smart. The other thing, which I think is really important to actually, um, and you're seeing this more and more in the market, um, is what we are calling at K2 Fin um, sort of pre-remediation. So what does that mean? So, it, you know, obviously people are familiar and compliance officers are familiar with, you know, the remedial steps you have to take after an enforcement action or enforcement activity, right? Of course, there's, you know, potential for a monitor, there are, you know, requirements for beefing up a compliance program, so on and so forth. But what we're increasingly seeing is that for clients where, you know, there's a potential or an alleged violation that may have occurred, they're taking pre-remediation steps um, that you know, prior to filing anything with the regulatory authorities or the enforcement um, agencies, to basically say, "Look, we saw this happen. We're going to submit it, but we know that you know we need to beef up our compliance processes um, and procedures, you know, immediately to make sure it doesn't happen again." And that's the type of sort of proactive activity that I think OFAC and the regulatory authorities really like to see, because what it's basically signaling is. We are taking this seriously. This is not something where it's like, oh yeah, that happened, and whatever, you know, it's 
not a big deal. It's very much a sort of a signal that we are on your side, enforcement agencies and regulatory authorities. We want to stamp out this activity. We realize that we haven't necessarily done as, as well as we want to, and we're going to proactively address it. And so coming to, you know, filing a VSD and including information about something like that can actually, you know, really be helpful in terms of a follow-on investigation to convince OFAC and others that there shouldn't be a civil monetary penalty or it should be a low, you know, penalty or, um, or that they shouldn't do anything in the first place. So I think those are some of the kind of key steps that, that compliance officers can think about and take um, if they think there's been an alleged violation. Eric, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I hope our listeners will join us tomorrow where we take up a very interesting topic of a new exposure for commercial corporations in the shipping space. I look forward to continuing the conversation. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Tom. Hope you've enjoyed this podcast episode in conversation with K2 Intelligence Finn on navigating an increasingly complex sanctions landscape with Adam Frey, Managing Director at K2 Intelligence Finn, and Eric Lorber, Vice President at K2 Intelligence Finn. This five-part podcast series was a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network, sponsored by K2 Intelligence Finn.